The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Hello, Viewpoint listeners. This is BaseNet Internet Television National Political Correspondent Tony Mizuko coming to you with Episode 6 of Viewpoint. I'm here today with our producer and director of programming for BaseNet, Ed Jupin. Hello, Tony. We're going to jump right into uh, a couple of uh, primaries and or caucuses and a primary tonight. Oh, yes. It is, uh, you know, primary and caucus season. Caucuses? Caucus I? I don't know. We'll go with caucuses, <laughs> I guess. But uh, we're going to start off with Nevada, and we're going to take you through these results because they're not that unexpected, but there's a couple of things we've all got to know about Nevada, what it means for the race. And then we're going to go into Missouri, Minnesota, and Colorado, which, ladies and gentlemen, might be a game-breaker or a game-changer. Briefly, I will say that Super Tuesday is March 6th, but uh, Tuesday, February 7th might be known as, you know, really important Tuesday. <laughs> really important Tuesday. Very, very good game-changer Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, exactly. Pretty major Tuesday sounds good to me. But interestingly enough, or perhaps not interestingly enough, is Mitt Romney won Nevada. Not really a shock to anyone. 50% of the vote. This is, I wouldn't say critical, but interesting for a couple of reasons. It's one of, it's one of the first times you're seeing Romney really break very high out of his 25-30% mold in somewhere that he wasn't completely expected to dominate. There are a lot of Mormons in Nevada. There are a lot of... Uh, I guess we'll say moderate or business Republicans in Nevada, but 50% is critical because it's showing that he's winning half the electorate. Now, I know that sounds like it's common sense, but Ron Paul's 18%, and just to go over the results briefly, it was Mitt Romney at 50%, Newt Gingrich at 21%, Ron Paul at 18%, and Rick Santorum at 10%. So Romney not only won 50%, but his main rivals, Gingrich and Santorum, he won by more than them combined. Ron Paul will fluctuate state to state, but Ron Paul's voters, although they may eventually support a nominee, are not going to abandon Ron Paul as, you know, he does worse in the polls or if he does or as he tends to, if he tends to do as well in some of the caucuses and primaries. Those voters aren't going anywhere. They're not your John Huntsman voters or your Rick Perry voters or sooner or later your Santorum or Gingrich voters or your Romney voters who, as their candidates tend to go down in the polls, they're going to shift. Ron Paul will stay with his percentage, give or take a couple points. So it's interesting that Romney beat his rivals by almost 20%. But here's the second important thing that we need to look at when we're looking at these uh, the results from Nevada. It's that Gingrich and Paul were within three percentage points, points of each other. And I believe delegate-wise, that means Newt only wins one more delegate than Paul did from the Nevada caucus. So really, that's statistically almost a tie. 21.1%, 18.8%. You're talking about a 2% difference, although a victory is a victory in politics. That's really a tie, which is interesting because people who seem to be searching for that conservative alternative to Mitt Romney are really not flocking to Newt Gingrich. And you'll see this later in the results from uh, Minnesota, Missouri, and uh, Colorado. But I think that's very important to notice that Newt Gingrich, although he technically came in second, you could say he tied for second. My impression is he really tied for third with this. Gingrich needed after a Florida walloping, he really needed to come in and show some strength, and he didn't do it in Nevada. He didn't do it later on. But Rick Santorum did pretty weak in Nevada, which if you were to look at that in and of itself, you would think that might spell an end for uh, Mr. Santorum. But as we get into Missouri and Minnesota and Colorado, you'll see that that's not the case. So I think what you're really seeing here is a Republican Party that is still trying to decide who they want. And I mentioned this last week in our last episode, and I'm always going to mention again, that's a good thing for the party. A knockdown, drag out battle is good for democracy, and it's good for the party, and we're seeing that here now. But even before we get in with uh, the Minnesota, Missouri, and uh, Colorado numbers, Trifecta Tuesday. Tonight, How does that sound? Trifecta Tuesday. Trifecta there you go. Tuesday. So we even before we get in with the numbers from Trifecta Tuesday, the numbers with the front runner up until this point. Romney, he's fallen even further behind in the head-to-head -head with Obama. Now, if he takes a significant hit on your trifecta Tuesday, there's a monkey wrench in the picture here. You know, it's interesting. For the first time in the last week or so, uh, the first, sec first two weeks of February, you're seeing Santorum poll ahead of Obama. And I don't put too much stock in this. But Romney's seen, falling behind him now. Right, and you've seen Paul poll ahead of Obama in certain polls. Romney's falling behind. Romney had always either parred with the president 
or been a little bit higher than the president. That is very, very interesting. But it's tough when you dissect those polls to determine what's really ha going on. Are people saying, and, and you know, it, yes, it's who you would vote for, but are people not picking Romney as much because they think he's not as likely to win or because they're not as thrilled with his candidacy? What the ultimate truth is, we'll probably never know. But I think that's very interesting that you're starting to see Romney, who did fantastic in Nevada. I mean, winning a four-person election with 50% of the vote is, you know, astounding. I mean, that would win you a Cajun election if you were down in Louisiana. That's very, very interesting, and he's starting to slip. Why is Mitt Romney starting to slip? Do we think it's because of Gingrich? My own opinion here of viewpoint is that I don't think it has anything to do with Gingrich. Gingrich won South Carolina, but that was so closely eclipsed by a win in Florida. And most of us have very short political memories, and I think the media contributes to that. Gingrich's win was overshadowed by Florida. Does it have to do with him releasing his tax returns or, or, or you know, not releasing his tax returns and how wealthy he is? His comments about he's not concerned about the poor, which were taken totally out of context. I don't think it has anything to do with that. I think it's a reflection that people are now questioning Mitt Romney because he's failed to deliver that knock all blow. So I think a lot of the people who now Mitt Romney's not pulling ahead of the president, it's because some people are actually interpreting that as who's more likely to win than who you would actually vote for. Because let me tell you one thing, somebody who was considering voting for Mitt Romney this early in the game and was previously in the Romney corner is very unlikely to switch to Obama. Because a lot of moderates in polling in every primary and caucus and election always shows this. A lot of moderates and independents don't make up their minds until very close until the election. So I don't think somebody who's unsure of themselves and unsure of their vote right now is actually going to say, oh, you know, I was a Mitt Romney fan. I don't like that comment. I'm now a Barack Obama fan. So in dissecting these numbers or attempting to dissect these numbers here of what's happening or not happening, I'm going to throw out something that I haven't heard at all on mainstream media, nor have I had heard it on new media. The wait, wait, sorry, I've, I've got to break in here. CNN just brought this breaking news: Barack Obama won the Democratic primary in Colorado. Oh my gosh! Yeah, shocker there. They they you know they're they're making a big deal about that. But sorry, go on. Wow, Barack Obama won. Look at that, amazing. He just might win his nomination, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. I'm going to throw out the age factor. Okay, now this is a BaseNet TV exclusive here because nobody is talking about this. Think back in recent presidential history. Uh, both Bill Clinton and George W. Bush were early, what, early 50s or something. You know, give or take Rick Santorum's age when they were elected to their first term. Sure. Okay. Then you had... Barack Obama, who was only 48 or something when he was elected to his first or maybe only term. Now, after having three presidents in a row being in their early 50s or so in, in their first term, do we want to go back to a grandfatherly-like person? And I'm even going to start it with Romney at only 65. Uh, do we want to go to somebody from 65 plus which is Romney and everybody else in the race. Well, Ed, let me, I'm, I'm going to go into this for you, and I'm going to give you my own opinion and, and explain a couple of things here. When I was a young kid and George H.W. Bush was running against Bill Clinton, I actually, and I, I, I'm, I was under the, under the double digits, had no idea who, um, had no idea about politics, couldn't tell you what a Republican was, what a Democrat was, but I supported George H.W. Bush over Bill Clinton. And I have hmm. very few memories, okay. but I remember... H.W. talking about why we were going to war and, you know, addressing the country and, and some vivid memories of the Gulf War. And I remember Bill Clinton and Ross Perot, oddly enough, I remember very fondly. Right. And I remember Bill Clinton playing the saxophone on Arsenio Hall. And George H.W. Bush reminded me of my grandfather. He reminded me of that, you know, that, that older kind of grandfatherly knows what's best, you know, knows what's going on, and somebody you can trust and rely on. And whereas I didn't necessarily feel the same way about Bill Clinton at a very young age. I don't think he had lost with any kind of age, but I think in, this is going to be a bit of a generational uh, jab here. But we're moving from older presidents who were part of that World War II greatest generation. You know, the generation that we trusted, the generation that did amazing things, the generation that sacrificed, that lived through real poverty, and now we're hitting, and I, I, this is not a knock at Mitt Romney, who, although he's in his mid-60s, could easily pass for his early 50s, or Ron Paul. But we're moving more into older candidates who are not that World War II generation. 
And those are the older baby boomers who, and, and you know, present company excluded, of course, really screwed the country up. So I think that generational change might be that we're no longer seeing a World War II fighter pilot, a World War II actor as Ronald Reagan was, whatever he happened to be. We're starting to see people who, like Newt Gingrich, who's in his late 60s or, or mid to late 60s, you know, they weren't part of the Second World War generation. And they're not quite the younger, you know, 60s and 70s generation. And I think that could possibly be happening. Now, Mitt Romney, I don't think the age factor is necessarily an issue because he doesn't present himself as somebody who's 65 or older. No. You, you would not think he's that old by looking at him. He doesn't act that way. He doesn't walk that way. He doesn't dress that way. Ron Paul is definitely a grandfather. He's a grandfather, he sure. He looks grandfatherly. But the lovable grandfather, and that's why right. he's got his think, diehard following. Exactly. And I think the fact that so it's interesting that so many young people – are supporting the really old candidate in the race. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but you bring up a very fascinating point that Bill Clinton, very young, very youthful. George H., uh, George W. Bush, if you look at pictures of George W. Bush from, from right around September 11th or, or the first... Oh, it, it's so, amazing. It, it is. You, you know, he is this very young-looking president. Yeah. And he had that young... And I remember during the time of the campaign, everyone said, you know, he's the kind of guy you'd like to have a beer with. Yep. And which is something I've mentioned here before on uh, on Basenet, and he came off as very young and youthful. And Barack Obama, of course, very very young looking, a very young man. I mean, he's not he's not uh, an old individual. In terms of the age gap, I think you're possibly seeing that, and that could be why and we're going to get into this in a minute. Santorum did so well in some of these other states, is because they're looking at a more youthful candidate who they perhaps trust a little bit more to get done what they feel needs to get done. Rick Santorum certainly has the age, and I think Santorum's in his late late 40s. He's 50. Uh, he's 50, but he does look very young. Yep. You know, he looks really good for his age, just like Romney does, but you get a different perception. And again, in my mind, and perhaps I'm wrong, but when I look at an older candidate, and I, I'm a fan of Ron Paul in full disclosure, I'm not seeing that World War II toughness generation. I don't really see that from Newt Gingrich, and I like Newt Gingrich. But Newt Gingrich comes off as a cranky old man who's a cranky old man, whereas H.W. Bush could certainly come off as a cranky old man. But this is a man who was a, a fighter pilot in the Second World War and got shot down and, and, you know, lived through to tell the story. You know, he was somebody who lived through the Depression. So I think I don't want to say we're starting to have a different impression of our elders, but as the baby boomers become the elders in our society, I think – Maybe there's a little bit of skepticism that, hey, not all of these baby boomers uh, have made all their best decisions over the years. Personally, I think we should throw the baby boomers out with the bathwater because I think a lot of them did wreck this country. And those are, unfortunately, the, the Obamas and more so the Clintons and the, H and the W. Bushes. So I think that's where that age dynamic starts to come in. We're not associating – and perhaps it's a bad thing for society. We are not associating – an older president with a certain degree of experience that we once did. The fact that Newt Gingrich was a college professor in the 70s, nobody really cares about. And this is why everybody needs Basenet TV and Viewpoint, because mainstream media is not talking about this. No, they won't talk about it at all. They won't mention the age. I'll, I'll, I'm going to criticize the mainstream media here real quickly. They were so quick to call a Romney or Gingrich victory, but they waited and waited and waited to call Santorum victories. And I want to know why. I want to know what their reason was. I think it's bull. Uh, you know, this is an adult program. I can say it. I think it's bullshit that, you know, it's 901 and they like to make their calls and, oh, yeah, we're calling it for this person. We're calling it for that person. And I think that that's wrong. But they're so quick to call it when it's somebody who's photogenic, who's supposed to be the pr front runner, when they know how to run the story. But all of a sudden, Santorum starts winning these primaries and it's, oh, you know, we don't, we don't know how to, we know how to present this. We know how to run it. <laughs> We're going to wait to call this one and hope that something changes. You know, let's hope somebody does some voter fraud and change it up there. And if you look at if you look, if you go back to and I don't know if you can, but you go back to February 7th, you look at the date, you look at the Fox News and the CNN. Anytime Romney or somebody won a primary big and giant all across the screen, so and so wins the primary and there's articles. Well, Rick Santorum might change the race. Are you kidding me? He just destroyed Romney in a couple of these primaries. And you're you're just saying, you know, it's going to change the race like it's some little insignificant story. So that's my little rant against the mainstream media. But you're right. Nobody wants to talk about age and the perception of age in the mainstream media because they're afraid they're going to offend people. Yeah. Well, I'm not worried about offending people. I think – and again, don't take this wrong. Ed, Ed's not a baby boomer for those of you out there. He's, he's a new millennial like me. Ed was born in 1982. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you very much. 
he, you know, a lot of baby boomers, as they came through the 60s and 70s, they did ruin this country. They did have a lot of great ideas and got screwed up. And let me tell you something. Here's why I support Ron Paul over Newt Gingrich, because he called it best with Newt Gingrich. He called Gingrich a draft dodger. And that's exactly what Newt Gingrich was. That's what Bill Clinton was, too. Newt Gingrich tried to use the excuse in a prior debate that he didn't serve because he was married with a kid. And Ron Paul turned around and said, I was married with children too, and I serve my country. And that's a generational difference between these boomers and the H.W. Bush. When you had all candidates like Reagan and H.W. Bush on the stage, there isn't a single one of them that had any kind of a deferment or went to Canada or went to college or had some bullshit family excuse for not serving the Second World War. They all served and they all fought. And now you've got people up there like Gingrich, and this has happened for the last 10 or 20 years, who, you know, oh, I had a family. Well, Ron Paul had a family. Other people had families. And some of them didn't come back to their families because they went and served their country. So we've maybe lost respect for some of our older politicians because when you look at a man like Newt Gingrich, you know, that, that sort of moral authority that somebody like a Ron Paul has just isn't there. Now, you can't hold Barack Obama responsible for not serving in a war. I don't think he was old enough to fight in Vietnam. Yeah, he was an in-betweener. So. Exactly. So I don't hold him against that. You know, W. Bush and his, was he in the Air National Guard? Was he not? I don't know what the deal is with that. You know, it's tough to say. Herman Cain, even who I'm a fan of, said that, you know, he served in the Department of the Navy. They said, we don't want you to go to Vietnam. We want you to work on missile trajectories or whatever, which, to be honest with you, I don't know how that works. So my guess is if you can calculate a missile trajectory, you're probably fairly valuable <laughs> uh, individual. But so I think that's why that age factor might come into play because you're looking at somebody like a Gingrich in, in that level of respect and veneration that we have for that tough, tough World War II generation just isn't there. You had that level of respect with Ronald Reagan. He was, he was grandfatherly and he was sage and he was wise and Gingrich tries to play like that, but he doesn't come off that way. And Ron Paul has a very different character. I'm not saying he's not sage or wise. He's a little bit more, I guess I would say spry most people his age and the way he comes off, but you don't see that with Gingrich. And I think that's why there is, you know, a, a perception of the age is, you know what, there's no natural respect that comes to a political candidate, at least, with having been of a certain generation anymore. George H.W. Bush, I mean, you know, when he's on TV talking about this will not stand with Saddam Hussein, you, you got the impression that this guy in his late 60s or 70s at the time was going to jump over the desk and, you know, knock mm -hmm. Saddam out himself. I mean, you don't get that with a lot of these politicians today. I think to an extent, the media plays a role, perhaps uh, they don't intend to, but, you know, it is about who's photogenic. And that goes back 40 years to the Nixon-Kennedy debates where, you know, the, one of the first televised debates and, you know, Nixon had the flu and he hadn't shaved and he looked like shit. And it's interesting because everyone that watched that first Nixon-Kennedy debate or the first televised one, if they watched it on TV, every single one of them said Kennedy won. Right. People that listened to it on the radio said hands down that Nixon mm -hmm. won. So there is that perception, and you know, I, I'm picking on Newt Gingrich here, but you know what? It, it, it's it's partially my show, so I can pick on who I want. The guy looks like crap. He looks like a guy that's 68 years old and is at the end of his line because he hasn't taken care of himself. Yeah, just a frumpy old guy. Yeah, frumpy old guy, and you're overweight, and, and not like you know that little weight that comes with middle age. Like you need to lose 40 pounds overweight, Newt. You know, get on the treadmill or something. And I think that photogenically, Newt's just not there. Whereas Rick Santorum is very photogenic. And, you know, Mitt Romney is very photogenic. Barack Obama, in full disclosure, a man who, you know, I hate with a passion, is very photogenic. He looks great in a photo. I don't understand. Real side note here, you know, pictures of the president, he sometimes seems to be very, very gray. And sometimes he's only moderately gray in relation to his hair color. I don't know what's going on there. I don't know if somebody's tweaking those pictures, but there are sometimes he looks like he's dyed his hair completely silver. Well, that's, that's, that's one of those conspiracy theories that there's two Barack Obamas as well. And they, they march out a different Barack for uh, different events, just like there were supposedly a bunch of different Saddam Husseins. So yeah, that's that's actually a conspiracy theory that floats around out there that there's more than one Barack. Oh, is it really? That's a riot! Yeah. I've got to I've got to look that up. That yeah, is... and they they also say um, something about I, I don't believe it's the tie. I believe it's like you know how they normally wear the flag on their lapel or something. Yep. The two Baracks wear different lapel tacks. <laughs> and uh, you, you can supposedly tell which Barack it is because the one Obama has the grayer hair and he's got one type of lapel tie. The other Obama is um, less gray and he's got a different type of tack on the lapel. Ladies and gentlemen, Google this stuff because this is fascinating. There I can't believe people out there actually believe it. There are two 
Barack Obama's. I don't know what the deal is with the man's hair. I just noticed by looking at the pictures. Maybe, you know, it has to do with his menstrual cycle or something. <laughs> <laughs> so so what's happening on your Trifecta Tuesday? Oh, Trifecta Tuesday. Right now, I'm telling you, Trifecta Tuesday, copyright, based on internet television. That is our term, Trifecta Tuesday. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Nevada show, uh, did not show Rick Santorum much love, but he did get shown some love in Missouri and Minnesota because he won both of those primaries. Now, how big of a fact is it that Missouri isn't a uh, isn't awarding any isn't awarding any delegates delegates and, tonight? Mm, they're they're in, they're uh, going to caucus in March, I believe, sometime, and then that's right, when the delegates will be awarded. Newt was not involved in Missouri. Right. He did not get on the ballot, which is another thing. You know, again, my show. I'm going to bash the man because I feel like doing it. Newt can't even get on the damn primaries and all these ballots. What kind of legislator is this man? Yeah, because like, he missed Virginia as well. Yeah, 55% or so went to Santorum. So what that shows is everyone virtually that was voting, some of Paul's people, but everyone that was voting for Gingrich went for Santorum. Santorum is the conservative alternative. Mm -hmm. Romney only won a quarter percent of the vote, which is interesting. That's that quarter percent we keep talking about here on Viewpoint yep. that Romney can't seem to beat. And in a fairly conservative state or a state that tends to pick a more conservative candidate, Romney couldn't get above that quarter. Again, he's going to win Missouri in the general election. I'm not worried about that. But it's about that voter turnout. It's about that enthusiasm. Santorum trounced them in uh, in Missouri. Paul held on to his 12%, which you know, I would say between 8 and 12, maybe an average of 10 or 12, is that hardcore Ron Paul. That is not going anywhere. That is never going anywhere. That will turn into a write-in vote for Ron Paul, uh, short of some you know uh, agreement at the convention. Not a very big win for Paul, a resounding defeat of Romney. If Romney had come into these three elections and won handily, if Romney had won Missouri, I would probably be willing to say it's a wrap-up because the man just won a state in the South handily, but he didn't. Romney lost it. He lost Missouri. The fact that their delegates don't get uh, applied to later in March, Super Tuesday could have an impact on where they go. If Rick Santorum collapses between now and then, sure, they'll go somewhere else. Because I think it's one of those states where they're not obligated to go by whoever won it. They can go wherever right. it is they want. Or I think it's 33 are supposed to be tied to the uh, caucus on February 7th, and there's a couple that are unpledged. Mm -hmm. So they'll go along with where they're supposed to, unless, you know, if Rick Santorum drops out next week or before Super Tuesday, they'll just pledge. Um, they'll actually they'll go to Romney, which means it'll be a wrap-up for Romney for the most part. Definitely a mistake on Newt's part because he would have done well there. And he could have chucked up another win, whereas, unfortunately, Newt's looking at three losses for Trifecta Tuesday. Now, moving on to Minnesota, and I'm going to pull up the latest from Minnesota here. Yet again, Rick Santorum won Minnesota. And, and oh, yeah, again, breaking news, CNN did also call Minnesota for Barack Obama, just so we're there. Just so we're getting there. But interestingly enough, Minnesota, which is very, very different from Missouri, uh, you know, outside of Massachusetts, all these states are the same to us. Santorum won, and Paul came in second. So that's a very interesting difference there, that Minnesota, which is not as conservative as Missouri, but Minnesota does have somewhat of an independent streak, is pulling for Ron Paul. Romney came in a pathetic third. And he swept Minnesota four years ago. Oh, yeah, he did, and he came in third. I mean, that, he came in below Ron Paul. He's supposed to be the front runner. He can't even beat Ron Paul. In, in a state that he just, he blew away McCain in Minnesota four years ago. Yeah. So that goes to show that people just aren't, and I don't know what it is. Romney's not a bad guy, but people are not set on Romney. I think, you know, I think it's that Romney doesn't excite anyone, and, and that's kind of the problem there. And maybe that's what happened in Minnesota is he's not exciting enough. I had a theory about last year, or last cycle's presidential election, that the main reason McCain lost is that he wasn't different enough from Barack Obama. And I think that's where people, and I'm not saying Romney and Obama are the same way, but I think that's where people see Mitt Romney as not being a stark enough contrast. People want change. I don't mean Obama's hopey, dopey, changey thing. <laughs> but people traditionally, you know, they vote a party, uh, a party into power. They don't like it. They want to pick the other party because they want something different. Sometimes when you have a volatile election cycle like we've had lately, it's going back and forth real quickly. I mean, the Democrats, you know, are running the world, and then, oops, the Republicans were in the House two years later, and when people didn't think that would happen for another 30 years. So when there's volatility in the political market, so to speak, that tends to happen. But I think that what's important is Romney's not getting that excitability for people 
that, you know, Santorum might. Santorum offers a starker contrast to Barack Obama. Now, if you have half a brain out there in, in our podcast land and you really know the facts, you'll notice that you'll know that Romney is very different. He gets hit hard on health care a lot, which I think is why a lot of people are hesitant to go a lot of more conservatives are hesitant to go with him because they say, well, he passed health care in Massachusetts. That's very similar to Obamacare. And let me debunk that really quickly for all of you here out there in, uh, in our viewpoint listener land. Barack Obama and you know, Obamacare and Romney care. Well, let me start this way. Mitt Romney was governor of a liberal state in Massachusetts. A liberal state that is Massachusetts, not a liberal state within Massachusetts. Although in Massachusetts, we have many towns and cities that sometimes pretend they're not part of the state and some that we actually wish weren't part of the state. But that's <laughs> another uh, another issue altogether. So it's a very liberal state. It's a legislator that is commonly 90 percent or more Democrats. This is a very progressive state. It's always been a blue state. Mitt Romney could not have done more than he did in Massachusetts to you know, advance the conservative cause, so to speak. They tried. They put up a candidate in every state house election when Romney was governor. It was either right when he was elected or two years after. And they made this big plan. They're going around the state, and they, they had all these elections, and they lost handily. Massachusetts is a corrupt, democratic state. So when you say Romney signed health care into law in Massachusetts, if he had vetoed it, his veto would have been overridden. It's the same thing with gay marriage. He could have fought and fought and fought against it and stopped it, but at some point the legislature would have just done that and overrode whatever veto he had. They overrode a lot of his veto. So understand that out there is conservative especially when you're saying, well, I don't think Mitt Romney's conservative enough. He couldn't have gotten that much done in Massachusetts. Uh, not saying that he isn't a conservative or he tried to run, you know, govern as a moderate or whatnot, but he was limited by what he could realistically get accomplished. You're not going to change the demographics of a state overnight. Mitt Romney being the greatest conservative in the world is not going to change a state where the legislature is overwhelmingly Democrats. And that doesn't mean that they're Democrats in the sense that they're all liberals. They just all vote along the same lines. There are some Democrats in Massachusetts that would be moderate Republicans in other states that might even be conservative Republicans in some states. Some of our congressmen in Massachusetts are really Republicans by any other name, but they all vote Democrats. I mean, it's not Chicago's machine politics, but it's Massachusetts. You're a Democrat in Massachusetts. That's what you do. Part of that reason also, I also want to make sure everyone understands this, and I'm not saying that Mitt Romney's a fair-haired country club Republican. I mean, he sort of is. But most of the Republican Party in Massachusetts, they're fair-haired, rich country club Republicans. There's no conservative movement in Massachusetts. There's no conservative establishment in Massachusetts. It's not here. So what are you expecting Mitt Romney to be? He's, I think he's a very conservative guy. I think he has conservative policies. He has a conservative outlook. But he was governor of Massachusetts. There's not much you can do as governor of Massachusetts if you're a conservative. You try to make some changes. You do a little this or do a little that. And you kind of go along to get along. It's all you could really do. So that's my little blurb on why Mitt Romney's more conservative than I think people think he is. And yeah, trying- he's, he's in no way, shape, or form any type of a liberal. Come on. He's not. I don't even know any type of moderate. He lived, no. he governed in Massachusetts. He's intelligent enough to realize that if he started picking on all these social issues in Massachusetts, not only would it not help him get elected or get reelected, but it wouldn't actually work. He wouldn't get anything done. Right. He lived in Massachusetts. You kind of have to run in the state you've lived in for a while or lived in for, you know, recently for a while, at least as governor. Other positions you can pop in as a senator after two years and you know, like Hillary Clinton did with New York. She right. never lived in New York, showed up, ran for Senate, ran for the Senate and won. I mean, she was also a former first lady, so that's a little bit different. So, I mean, Romney did what he could do. He ran for governor of his state, and that's probably why he only served one term. Comparatively, you could say Deval Patrick, a progressive liberal Democrat, has had a lot of policy successes because everyone seems to agree with him in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's where you got to understand. We're going to move on, and, and again, I'm going to go back to uh, talking about Minnesota's results just to finish this up. Gingrich, poor man, came in fourth. I think I'm willing to make a prediction that although Gingrich will probably hold on through Super Tuesday, because at this point it's less than a month away, I think Gingrich is done. I mean, he he couldn't get on the ballot in the state he needed to win. He did terrible in Minnesota. He did poorly in Nevada. And Colorado, Gingrich's results were pretty, uh, you know, underwhelming, really. He's just not really pulling what he needs to pull. To win, and I think even if Gingrich had won one of these, eh, I'm not really that sure he's gonna, uh, you know, he's gonna really pull it off. 
it, it's just it's it's unfortunate. Let me pull up his some of his numbers from Colorado. Yeah, I mean Gingrich is just not he's just not able to pull it off. I think he's done. I think we're seeing the nail in the coffin. Oh, also breaking news. I don't know if I mentioned this. CNN also predicted Barack Obama would win the Democratic nominee, the uh, Democratic primary in Colorado, just because you know. Thank you, CNN, for putting that on there. He received all the delegates. For those of you out there who are wondering, so Barack Obama's delegate count is currently all whatever the number uh, is. Nobody voted for Hillary. <laughs> I'm surprised. We should have another Operation Chaos this year where people try to nominate Hillary. Yeah. But yeah, so, uh, you know, Gingrich just did terrible. I mean, I'd have to plug all the numbers in, but I mean, he might have done worse than Ron Paul. Not that I'm bashing Ron Paul, so any of the Paul listeners out there, but I mean, you expect Paul, and I believe me personally, I would hope he would do much better, but he generally polls second, third, fourth. And I mean, Gingrich is just doing terrible. He's pulling le- under Paul for the yeah, most part. And some of them, and he's losing to Romney and Santorum. So you can be the second front runner. You can be the runner up. You can be the alternative, but he's not even the alternative. Oh. He's, he's the garbage. I mean, <laughs> it sounds mean, but he's the trash that needs to get taken out. You're going to have, I think a Romney Santorum battle with Ron Paul as a third alternative or Ron Paul holding up the libertarian wing of the party, mm-hmm. but it's really a Romney Santorum, uh, a show. And I think that after I trifecta have, Tuesday, it is trifecta Tuesday is, is, is you know, in some ways it might be more important than Super Tuesday. Rick Santorum's political career, and I've always said this, I've followed it for years, he was polling at, you know, 1% or 2% nationally in Iowa. Rick Santorum got screwed, and honestly, I, I can, I'm a very conservative individual. The Republican Party or whoever ran the elections in Iowa, they should all be lined up and just pushed out of the frigging country. I'd say something worse than that, but I'd probably end up in the uh, crosshairs of Homeland Security. But we should deport every last one of the bastards to some terrible country like Canada or something like that <laughs> so that you know they just don't get to live in America anymore. The man won, and they couldn't count the votes. I yep. mean, it's 2012. It's been 40 years since we sent a man to the moon, and these idiots can't count votes. I mean, Rick Santorum really, really got screwed. You can't imagine the difference out there in, in podcast land between, you know, a tie, a small win, and, oh, wait, Santorum actually really won. He got screwed by Iowa, but he did well in Iowa, and he was nobody before that, and then he was propelled, and then he didn't do so well in uh, New Hampshire and in Carolina and in Florida. And now, all of a sudden, Santorum is back. You know, this is a smart man who has played smart politics, and he is still in the race. Everyone was saying Santorum should drop out. Recently, a couple weeks ago, Gingrich was saying Santorum should drop out. I'll tell you what, if I was Rick Santorum and I was up on the stage tonight uh, on a Trifecta Tuesday, rather, I wouldn't have given a nice speech about winning and going forward and the alternative. I would have turned around and told Newt Gingrich to kiss my ass. Because mm-hmm. Newt Gingrich can't even seem to get on the ballot in the primary, let alone <laughs> win them. You know, Newt Gingrich said very, very early on, when he before he was a front runner, before he was polling high, when everyone was talking about somebody else, that he was going to run the most unconventional campaign, something nobody's ever seen before, and this and anything. Well, yeah, you know what? Nobody's ever seen such a terrible campaign yeah. before, Gingrich. I mean, come on. Get on the ballots, will you, man? And he just insists that he is taking it all the way to the convention, and he's just going to divide his party even further. He, he's going to get alienated because I'm telling you, the conservatives that are out there, once they rally around someone, once they've left somebody, they're not going to go back to them. Right. These polls are going to get people thinking that Gingrich is crazy, that he's not got a chance to win. And if the media does their job, which they won't because they tend to screw things up, they'll stop focusing on Gingrich too because he's just not really prevalent. Yeah, exactly. I mean, how much coverage can you give the third person in the you know in third place? And I know some Ron Paul supporters would say that you know Ron Paul doesn't get enough coverage, and I think they're absolutely right. He doesn't. But you know, when you start looking at the message and the types of candidates that these are, Paul has a very distinct and clear message. Romney has his message. Santorum is sort of a counter to that, and then Gingrich is sort of eh, up there and in the middle. And I think Gingrich's problem so far has been that he's got the ideas, he's got the intelligence, but he comes off as an asshole. Just cranky, like you said. Yeah, he's absolutely. Very cranky. He, he's a you crank- know, you you look at Ron Paul, who's just even, even when he's fun. even when he's serious, he's this happy-go-lucky grandfather type. He is, and you know, mm-hmm. and he he believes in what he believes in, and he yeah. has his his values and. He just, I think, believes in a better country, whereas I think Gingrich just believes in being better than people or being mm-hmm. smarter than people. And the, the all the negative elements of his personality are just showing through so much. And Gingrich is really a brilliant man, despite the fact that he can't get on the ballot in a couple of states, which you know, I don't think is actually hard to do. Gingrich is a brilliant, brilliant man, and he just can't pull it off. He doesn't seem presidential enough. He seems 
like a great speaker of the house, like a great legislature, but he, he legislator, but you know, Gingrich is just being a jerk and people are picking up on that. The big ideas have to come with the ability to communicate those ideas as well. And that's where he fails. What was one of the best things people always said about Ronald Reagan about what was Ronald Reagan great about? He was the great communicator. He was able to communicate these ideas to people with a sense of, of passion, but a sense of importance and urgency. And in, I hate to use the term, but I mean, a degree of professionalism. You listen to, you know, Ronald Reagan speak and there's a calming factor. And yes, he was an actor and he had trained all that. We know all that. But when you listen to him, there was something about him. There was a certain sincerity there. Whereas any time Gingrich speaks, there's sort of a, I'm trying to prove I'm smarter than you. I'm trying to prove this is right. And he, he's right on so many of the issues. Gingrich also early on earned a lot of favor by people because he attacked the media, always popular among people. Still does. Kids. Still does. Yeah, he has no use for the media. Yeah, and he had said that he was not going to go after his opponents. And in any time you're running against somebody in a race, you do have to go after your opponents. Yeah. You do have to, you know, attack them. But Gingrich was really the first one to start getting really dirty. Mm -hmm. And for somebody who says they're not going to be, you know, the, the candidate that goes dirty or goes after his opponents, and then you start getting so dirty, and then you start throwing out cheap shots like, oh, Rick Santorum should get out of the race and he should just drop out. Well, I'm sorry, Gingrich, but this is this is why it is what it is. This is why it's coming back to bite you in the butt. I don't think Gingrich can take it all the way to the convention unless by some miracle he wins every contest on Super Tuesday. I think Gingrich is done. He's got that one rich backer out in Las Vegas that's going to continue to give him money and continue to fund his campaign. But even that guy at some point has to look at it and say, you know what? It's just not worth it. Gingrich just can't deliver. Gingrich lost Trifecta Tuesday decisively. Santorum won Trifecta Tuesday decisively. Well, now here's the point about Santorum, who has no money either. Now, Trifecta Tuesday cost these people no money. There was no advertising spent for your our trifecta Tuesday here yep. so now going further uh, into Super Tuesday and beyond when we go into these states where because Santorum had a successful night on in Minnesota and Missouri and so on and so forth depending when you're looking to this podcast so I don't want to keep referring to it as tonight because it's not tonight for you anymore but you know, because uh, he was successful in Minnesota and Missouri, now going on to other states where he is now going to have to worry about his advertising budget, the, the money's just not there. So this ultimately is why this is still Romney's race to win, because he's got a gazillion dollars in the bank. That's true, but you know, the money may start to flow to Rick, because traditionally it does after people win a primary too. And I'm sorry, you know, Trifecta Tuesday was very good for Santorum. He's going to get a chance to bank some money. But here's the other thing. He won Trifecta Tuesday without really putting that much money into it. Didn't put anything in. There was no advertising in Missouri and uh, Minnesota anyway. Exactly. So it really makes you wonder what's going to happen on Trifecta Tuesday. Could this be a case where Romney spends millions of dollars and people aren't going to win? Because remember, money is important, I think, at this stage for the campaign, for the organization. The advertising, not so much because – Primary voters and caucus voters, caucus goers, tend to be a little bit more informed on the issues, especially if it's a closed primary. They tend to know who they want and look into it a little bit more. So that advertising is not as prevalent and is not going to be as important, I think, as it would be in certainly a general election right. where you know, you're trashing your opponent. I think that Romney's cash advantage is only going to show through in the organization because at this point in the game – it's going to be tough for Romney to put out an ad because what is he going to do? Is he going to attack Santorum in the ad? Well, what if they both look bad and Gingrich gets up? You know, is he going to attack Paul in an ad? Well, that's not going to get you any favors. His supporters will probably hack your website and you deserve it. You know, Ron Paul might throw out a couple of his ads, which Ron Paul's ads are always very entertaining, but they're a little mm -hmm. out there, I guess, like him. So I think that that might be Mitt Romney's problem is he might have the money, but Super Tuesday is too many contests. You know, and then we can't forget about Maine coming up, uh, what is it, the 28th of May or the... March? Next Saturday, as, as we're recording, next Saturday. Uh, so that's what, the, the 11th, the 12th? Yeah, the yep. And, so, that's, and that's still um, leaning towards Ron Paul. Exactly. So, I mean, that could totally throw things into a, uh, you know, into the mix. I don't think that the advertising budget is going to really make a difference because it's about the organization. Now, it's possible that because of Romney's gazillions... He's got the organization on the ground in a lot of Super Tuesday states, whereas he, Santorum or somebody else, might. But remember, Hillary had planned up to Super Tuesday and not beyond that, and she fell apart. 
I don't know the extent that Romney expected it to be a a given that he would win the nomination. It's not given as of now, and it certainly won't be for a while. But I think going into Super Tuesday, that might be the problem is that all of a sudden nobody really plans for a Super Tuesday strategy. It's sort of if you've done everything right up until Super Tuesday, that's the crown on your head. You won Super Tuesday. I don't think a lot of candidates plan out how to win Super Tuesday in that sense. I mean, obviously they plan how to win Super Tuesday. I'm not saying they don't. But Super Tuesday, a lot of times, is supposed to be really like the crowning achievement of uh, of the primaries. Well, it, it, I, I have to agree with your your buddy David Gergen. Yep. He, as I do, says that Romney's going to be the eventual nominee. So now, I, I still truly believe that, that Romney will be the eventual nominee. But just as the current polls are showing, could he beat Barack Obama? The 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 answer is maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and the answer yeah. is always going to be maybe because you're not going to see. As you've like, said many times on this show, it's very difficult to defeat an incumbent anybody, absolutely. and a, an incumbent in general. And now, if if the economy or the job market turns around slightly, as the numbers have been, and now it looks like. Just tonight, we had the breaking news that we're going to start looking into what we could potentially do in Syria. We don't know what's going to happen with Iran. So now if we have two more wars on the horizon in Syria and Iran, the president does the right thing and handles those properly. With right now, Romney behind uh, head-to-head with Obama, the economy turns around, the job market turns around, we get into conflicts outside of calling them wars. We get into conflicts with Syria and Iran. I, I don't know that Romney then would just have the wherewithal to actually beat Obama in a general. You know, that it, it depends. I think Obama's going to try to run on foreign policy successes, but I don't know if that's really going to make a difference in the view of a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of moderates, a lot of independents. If Syria were to fall, and whether it's, you know, we arm the rebels, we shoot a few cruise missiles or whatnot, Syria falls, which would be good geopolitically for the U.S. and the region, and it's a Libya-like situation. I mean, what actually happened in Libya was terrible because the Islamists are just going to take over, and it's going to take over in Egypt as well. So not a good thing, but he'll be able to play that off well, and people might be able to say, you know, yeah, I, I think we've done really well in the world. It's a safer world or whatever. The big problem is Iran and the economy. Now, people are saying the economy's improved, the numbers look that way, but people say the labor force participation rate is down. So remember, you're always going to look at all the figures and everything that's out there. I don't think, and they're going to try to pretend and make it look that way, that the economy's really going to be any better come November. Between now and then, there's just not enough time for enough people to get jobs back. And although people might perceive that the rate is better, People that are still unemployed or underemployed are still going to feel like the economy hasn't gotten any better. Not to mention, people are going to pick up on the debt, the deficit, inflation. Now, we've got to look at Iran, and, and that's really a, a trickier issue. I don't think a conflict with Iran would necessarily be a small conflict, and a bigger conflict that would take more time would be complex. I don't know how the public would feel about replacing a president in the middle of a conflict, unless it's a conflict we're not supportive of. Iran and the United States, it's interesting. I was actually earlier today looking at a map of Iran and trying to figure out what they're going to do in the event a conflict would break out, what they're trying to do. Because, you know, I don't really have anything else better to do with my time than stare at a Google map of Iran and try to figure out what they would do. <laughs> There's two potential, three really potential, four, four, sorry, potential Iran scenarios. And I'm going to run through these quickly because each one of these would probably be disastrous for the president depending on how they would work out. Iran doesn't really have the ground capabilities to launch a ground war against one of its neighbors. But Iran rallies their ground forces, and instead of closing the Gulf like they said they were going to, they could invade Afghanistan. Now, that could end up seriously, you could see thousands upon thousands or tens of thousands of U.S. troop deaths because I don't think we're really equipped in Afghanistan to go against you know tanks and artillery and stuff like that. I don't think the Iranians are going to wing long term. The damage to them is going to be far more than it is to us, but all of a sudden, them slamming across the border, which is actually not that easy in that region, would do two things. Cause a lot of U.S. casualties, because I don't think our forces are designed in Afghanistan for that kind of conflict. And again, the Iranians don't exactly have the greatest ground force in the world. It's not that I'm worried about tank for tank, the Iranians being able to beat us, but, but, but no, by any means. 
but it would cause a lot of disruption, cause a lot of death, people wouldn't be happy, and it would cause a great deal of instability. You would probably see the Afghan government fall. That would just create a nightmare. I mean, it would, God only knows what we would do in that situation. We'd literally be trying to reoccupy the cities we're already occupying. That's option one, not going to end well for the president, not going to end well for Iran either. But if Iran preempts that and we respond, it's going to be very tough for people to be supportive of the pre- – actually, that would probably be the best scenario for the president because he could say we're responding to an attack on our ally and on our forces. Option two, we have withdrawn from Iraq, our combat forces. Iran is only about a day's drive across the desert from Baghdad. Right. They could take everything they have and slam it right into Iraq. They're not going to be able to invade and occupy Iraq forever. But let me tell you, the sight of Iranian tanks running down Baghdad is going to really, really screw things up. And what's our solution in that? We'd be back at war in Iraq. Back in Iraq. Dragged back into Iraq. It would be That would be a disaster for the president because they'd say, you took our forces out and this happened. And Iran's not doing that to occupy Iran, Iraq and take the territory. They're going to create such a destabilization that it's going to be a nightmare to fix. And remember, the southern part of Iraq is all Shiites, just like Iran. Iran could invade. You could have the Shiites in Basra in the south declare themselves independent, and there's no Iraqi government to oppose it because they've just pushed them out of Baghdad. So then part of Iran, Iraq is now part of Iran, and it's on the border of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait where there's a lot of the world's oil. That, that would be a nightmare scenario. Option three, Iraq, uh, sorry, Iran invades southern Iraq because the Iraqis don't really have a military to repel them. We have a lot of forces in Kuwait, which would be difficult for the Iranians to eject, but they're they're sort of doing this. You got a picture on on a sort of suicide uh, gamble. They invade Iraq, they invade uh, Kuwait, and the part of Saudi Arabia which is near Kuwait where a lot of their oil is, and Iran could just simply be looking to destroy the uh, the oil facilities. Here's what happens. What happens when Iran launches everything they have on these Gulf oil facilities, wrecks Iraq, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia's oil production? I mean, what are we going to respond with? Destroying their oil production and then the world can't get oil? All of a sudden, we may have to bargain with Iran for their oil after something like mm-hmm. that. Option four, closing the Strait of Hormuz. Eh, I don't really think that's a smart idea for the Iranians. And hopefully we're not thinking so one-dimensional. Because if they did mine and close the straits, and I think they'd only be doing it to try to destroy our naval craft in the area. They'd want to sink an aircraft carrier. But I think what would happen is we would disarm the mines sink whatever Iranian naval vessels are in there. We'd attack their air forces and their missile bases, and then it would just, I mean, that would be probably the best case scenario because I don't think Iran has anything to gain. But again, you're talking about a suicidal regime, and I think if you've read articles recently, they've been in the news that uh, the Ayatollah has said that, you know, the Great Reckoning or something like that is coming. I think because the economy is in free fall in Iran, because the protests, the Green Revolution, or whatever it was a couple of years ago, were massive. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets of Iran. They're teetering on the edge between really destruction and, and collapse. So I think that the Iranian regime is trying to psych their people up because they're moving into the end game zone, or the end zone, I should say, for their regime. And I think they realize that, that it's not a tenable situation. It's not likely to get better. So they might do something where they decide to react suicidally. And, and, you know, launch their forces against that gay Afghanistan or Iraq. So you got to look at it in that sense. There's a lot to destabilize. And let me tell you, I don't think people are going to be happy with the president. I think he's going to try to rally us to defend or, or, or whatever. But I think a lot of Americans are going to say, what are we even doing to begin with now that they're causing all this craziness? You know, it, it remains to be seen. So a, and I hate to use the terms, but a quick, clean conflict in Syria, beneficial. Absolutely beneficial to the president's presentation of his foreign policy I think anything with Iran is much, much more likely to create a bigger problem and create a economic devastation or, or an economic havoc. The problem for the Republicans, for Mitt Romney per se, he's been very hawkish on Iran, as the president has sort of been somewhat hawkish. But the president in that situation, obviously, you're, you know, we're at war in Iran, he would become very hawkish in that situation. So Ron Paul is the only alternative who said we shouldn't have been there in the beginning. So. I guess a war in Iran, Romney can't say that the president's making a bad decision because he's somewhat advocating the same situation. So, again, Syria, possibility, Iran, uh, I don't think that would end well for the president. But that's just my analysis. Is Romney going to be the eventual nominee? Probably. 
you know, I guess that's the best way I would say it. He's probably going to be the nominee, but Trifecta Tuesday really took the wind out of Romney's sails. Now we're going to have to wait till Super Tuesday, which is not as, you know, not as great as a term as Trifecta Tuesday. <laughs> but um, no, we're going to have to wait till Super Tuesday to really see what happens. And, and, you know, that could be Romney's coronation. But if you see on Super Tuesday results similar to Trifecta Tuesday, well, Romney can't be the nominee and he won't be the nominee. But it's all going to depend. I think the next we're, we're approaching the T minus less than 30 days of real crunch time. Now, if the Super Tuesday goes in five different directions, and, you know, then it's pretty much a battle out to the convention and people have to be, you know, fighting for something. And who knows? Rick Santoro might be, hey, I'll let you get the nomination as president. You better pick me as my running mate. Mm -hmm. You know, that could absolutely happen because Rick Santorum's young enough that he could serve four to eight years and then become president for four to eight years. So my predictions for Super Tuesday, it's going to be all over the place. We're going to have to watch in the next coming weeks. Oh, it's going to be a regional election, as we said a couple of weeks back. Yeah, that's true. We're going to have to watch where the fundraising goes. We're going to have to watch the media coverage because Santorum should start getting more media coverage than Romney. And um, I'm not sure what the debate schedule is for the next few weeks. But There's Santorum, only one debate before uh, Super Tuesday. There's a CNN debate. And, you know, so Rick Santorum being the front runner, should really have the front runner status in that debate and as he somewhat had in the last few debates i think you got to look and see if anyone's going to exit it's going to be gingrich although yep. he might stick around but super tuesday we're going to have to really see what happens it's all going to lead up to quite possibly a fight at the convention which i've said this last week i'll say it this week i'll say it next episode that's a good thing for our party who wants our democracy to be so you know clean and dry and, and wrapped up in just a couple of weeks like it's a formality democracy should never be a formality voting should never be a formality we're not electing the president of the ladies garden association of stowe massachusetts no offense madam president there but you know we're electing somebody who might be president of the united states of america they should have to fight in every single primary in every single caucus they should have to fight they should have to suffer through it it should be a brutal grueling process and you know what we should go back i could only imagine how great it would be to go back to the days where people are screaming and shouting on a convention floor to try to make some kind of a deal to get together that's democracy now listen the media i don't know they're either going to love it or hate it they're going to love it because they love conflict but they're going to hate it because they love a sure thing the Democrats are going to try to play it off as look at the Republicans, haha, -ha, they don't know what to do. And the Democrats are going to try to scare a lot of the Republicans out there to, to get them to think that they have to pick somebody to go for it. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not the case. Don't listen to the Democrats out there about the Republican nominee, and don't listen to the establishment Republicans about the need to pick somebody to go. The money will come, the advertising will come. Between August and November is enough time for the American people to decide whether they want Barack Obama or whoever the Republican alternative is. We can do it in a few months because we've done it in the past. We just need to keep up with this process. I think this is good, and we need to see more of this in our politics in this country. My prediction, a Romney, probably, but a cautious probably. I'll throw that in there. Could Santorum be the nominee? Stranger things have happened in politics. In the way Trifecta Tuesday turned out, he certainly could be. You never know what's going to happen, though. Ron Paul could pop up. But to wrap up our Trifecta Tuesday coverage... I think we're seeing the end of Gingrich's campaign really happen on Trifecta Tuesday. And I think you're seeing a new paradigm and the race is probably shaping up to be between Romney and Santorum with Paul now as the alternative. And that is my, uh, that's my analysis for the day. Ed, do you have anything else before we uh, close out the day? I have nothing. All right. Well, everyone, thank you for listening. As always, we encourage you to visit us at BaseNetTV.com, BaseNetTV.com. You can find us on Facebook. We're on Twitter and Google Plus and all that jazz. But always, 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 BaseNet TV is the best place to get to. Or you can link to not only Viewpoint but all of our other shows. You can listen to episodes of Viewpoint. And Ed, are we still on iTunes? Absolutely. I suggest you download us on iTunes. You can listen to us in the car. You can listen to us at the gym. You can listen to us when you're supposed to be listening to somebody else. Those of you who are out there in college, pop an iPod in. Listen to Viewpoint because it's probably more than your professor is going to be showing you. Just to wrap up the episode for today... Throw the, ba throw the baby boobers out with the bathwater is uh, the tagline for today. And just remember, out there in podcast land, Trifecta Tuesday is copyright-based on internet television. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we look forward to next week's episode.